proud and this and this and this. And one of the sins they will list down there is they doubt. Doubt is supposed to be sin. See, a doubt is when your mind is saying, wait, something's not right here. The man might be lying or there may be a mistake. That's doubt. It's a mechanism in the mind that signals the alarm, telling you, wait, 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 before you go on. Maybe something's wrong here. Maybe not. But doubt is a mechanism in the thinking faculty. But when you label that as a sin, it's a bad thing to do, to doubt, and then you make it a crime to question things. One famous evangelist who said when he was a young man, every time he thought about Trinity, his head hurt around the back, he said. And then one day he promised he wouldn't think about it anymore. He promised God, I won't worry about the Trinity anymore. And he said the headache stopped. Well, yes, they will, but <laughs> you can take the batteries out of your smoke alarm, too. It won't make that awful noise anymore. You say, that smoke alarm is it's such an irritating noise. When it goes off, I'll take the batteries out. Yes, but someday you may burn up in a fire, too, because you, you've taken away what was performing a valuable service. You can pull maybe a couple of wires out of the back of a computer. It will still work most of the time, but every so often it will do a silly thing because you have interfered with the proper functioning. The mind will do that, too. If you resolve, I am never going to doubt. I'll do everything else, but... If anything caused me to doubt, I simply won't doubt, I'll press on. You're going to be led to some strange results from time to time because you tampered with the, the circuitry. That's a, a healthy kind of an attitude. Uh, by the way, uh, the way that this is solved is usually in a, what's called a tautology. People turn a tight little circle, they'll tell you, I've seen it in print, they'll tell you, if you have doubts, this is a sin. What you must do in order to beat that sin is you must stop doubting. And after that, you won't have any doubts. Well, think about it. <laughs> you see, they told you, you want to quit doubting? It's easy. What you do is, you don't doubt. It's like saying, you want to stop smoking? Easy. Don't smoke. The rest is easy. It, it doesn't really give you very much. It can give you anything. Now, keep in mind, I'm saying this idea of putting doubt as uh, and sin as unfaith as being the real crime uh, may have its origins in Martin Luther or somebody else, I don't know, but it's come down to influence a large part of Christian thought today. And it's not clear cut. If you meet a Catholic, he may think like a Protestant. You may meet a Protestant who thinks like a Catholic. It's not a hard and fast rule, but these are two different kinds of thinking that you're going to meet. So, in any case, if you're talking to somebody, at least find out which type of thinking does he do. Does he believe that his religion is a matter of faith, or does he believe that the things that are true are things we should discover, we should think about, we find the true things? Or does he believe that, well, no, I'll sort of find the truth all at once, and then I'll promise to believe it? Is it by investigation, or is it by surrender? Both, both types of people tell you, well, investigate, but the one type will tell you, investigate, uh, and what he means is, take this. Uh, it doesn't really mean investigate. In fact, as somebody uh, told me one time, I'd itemized a number of arguments as we did earlier, and he stood up in the audience, he says, you're right, what I believe is unbelievable. A man can't believe what I believe unless he has the gift of faith from God. And when I asked him later, he came around, I said, how do you get the gift of faith from God? He said, there's only one way to get it. You have to believe all these things. <laughs> Again, it doesn't give you anything. And you can't believe it without this thing. You don't get this thing until you believe it. But what I want to stress here is that find out how somebody seems to function. If faith is his key, then he has a couple of problems. He has on the one thing a product that he can't deliver. That is, if a man says, I have faith, he might even be right, but he can't give you any of this. So keep that in mind. As I remember talking with somebody one time who said, I have proof such and such a thing. When I showed him his proof was insufficient, he said, no, no, I don't mean proof then. I have faith in this thing. Well, that's fine. Say you have faith then. Don't say you have proof. <laughs> because one man can give another man proof. He can't give another man faith. 
faith is some kind of a thing nobody can really explain to you, I suppose. They say it's on the inside. You can't take it out and give it to somebody. In other words, you can tell somebody what you believe. It won't help him believe it unless you can show him why you believe it. Bring something out he can look at. If a man says, on the one hand, I have faith for what I believe in, it's likely this is the same man who will tell you everything I believe is here in the Bible. This is the basis of my faith. By that he means the miraculous nature of this book is what convinces me, which is somewhat inconsistent with the position that I don't need anything to see. I have faith. I don't need a thing in front of me. So that it depends on which day you ask him this question. Maybe it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. He'll tell you what convinces me is this beautiful book. And Tuesday, Thursday, uh, he'll tell you, I don't need to see anything. I know God spoke to me or he gave me a gift of faith. Uh, you can't really have it both ways. There's also this point, which is well known in the scientific community today, that if a man tells you anything he thinks is true, he's proposing a theory, a hypothesis, he's supposed to bring with it a test of falsification. He's supposed to offer this thing and say, and if I'm wrong, you can prove it by doing this or that or the other. Otherwise, it's not worth listening to him. If he comes to you and he says, I have a thing which is true, and you say, how could I prove you wrong? He said, there's no way. Well, <laughs> wasting your time. You have to offer some way. The Quran is full of this kind of thing, where it says, this is true, because if it were false, couldn't you do this? Or why don't you try that? And so on. Offering people the challenge, saying, and if you don't think this is a revelation, then do this, do that, try these things. But a man who says it's all wrapped up in faith isn't offering a test of falsification. A man tells you, I'm convinced this is true. You should ask him, is there something I could show you which would convince you that you're wrong? If I could find it, name it for me. And at least maybe you can plant that idea in his mind that, in fact, there is nothing. He's excluded that. And so how valuable is his belief? He believes in a thing which he has never opened it to challenge. See, you're not, you're not asking him to tell you some thing which he knows is true, but he refuses to accept. You're asking him, tell me about something, however fantastic it is, but tell me about it that if I could bring it to you, you would see that you're wrong. And at least it may make him think about the value of what he has. The Muslim can do that easily enough, you see. As I say, the Quran is filled with that kind of thing. If somebody says that to the Muslim, you should be able to say, well, all right, as a matter of fact, I'll quit being a Muslim if you can show me such and such. The Quran gives you a list of suggestions, <laughs> those kinds of things. Tell people, go away and come back, bring me one of these, and I'll <laughs> come over to your side. I hope I've explained uh, satisfactorily enough what I mean by a falsification test, ask a man, how can you be uh, proved wrong? If, on the other hand, you have somebody who has said no investigation is the answer, uh, this is maybe more helpful, but this man, too, may claim that his belief is based on the things he sees in front of him, but he may betray that later on, because if you point out to him that some of the things he believes, he hasn't brought the proof for them, he may then tell you, but these are matters of faith, and so he's crossing back over into the other man's uh, uh, school of thought. We want to stress that. This basically is the way the Quran talks about dealing with religion, that your job is not to come to the Christian and say, look, you're wrong about these things. Here's the truth. Your job is to tell him, you're right about this and this and this. But when you say this, are you sure? Bring your proof. If you have proof, then I believe it too. But if you don't have proof, it may be right, it may be wrong, but you don't know. Neither do I. Let's leave it. In other words, Islam is what you have when you clean house. If you could go through your mind and take all the things that they might be true, but you don't have proof, put them in another compartment to say, whether they're true or not, I may find out sometime, but for now I'm going to set them here. What you'll have left are just the things that you know are true. You've got proof for those. That's the foundation of Islam. That's what the 